Kia hiu rā, i nga teino te tai au a rangi nui raua ko Papa Tuanuk. Te akine te whare nui a tāne ki te kore a hau ka kore he whare ora. Te akine te wai a tangaro ki te kore koe ka kore he wai ora. Te akine te hau a tāwhiri matia ki te kore ia ka kore he hau ora. A te akine, a te akine, huie tāi ki e. I mihi ana ki te rangi. I mihi ana ki te whenua. I mihi ana ki o koutou, ko tō mai nei, i roto i tini ahua tango o te wā. Nau mai, whakatau mai rā ki o koutou. I nga rā whakatā mai rā, ki tēnei wānanga ipurangi. Nau mai, nga mai whakatau mai rā, whakatau mai rā. Ki nga mate huhua o te motu, te whakaaro aroha hoki ki te whānau o te awhina marae i tēnei wā. Haere, haere, haere atu rā. Haere rā i runga e te au heke, au raki, i runga e te au miha. A rātou ki a rātou, a tātou ki a tātou, a kanohi ora o te wā. A ti hei, mauri ora. Kia o koutou, ko tā mai nei, ko tēnei wānanga. Ki whakarongo ki tautoko a te kaupapa, e kāranga nei, ki a tātou, kei te mihi, kei te mihi. Anō reira, tātou i huhui nei, ka mihi aki ki te kaupapa, a whakahirihira. Koe nei tātou i tui tui, a rā. Nga ranga hau, ku tai au, nga mātauranga, nga mahi i whakaaro katoa o te moana, kia whakapiri i hanga ki kotahi nga moana whakauka. Nō reira, e ki ana he whakatauki tēnā, tēnā rau whati, Tēnā, tēnā rau pōku, e nga mārei kura, e nga whata kura, ka tāku iti, ka tāku rahi, ki a haumare i te noho, a koutou, a tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou. Ka ua tainui ki Aotearoa nei, ka takahi e tamato o te whenua, ka piki a hau ki te tihi o Tokomaru, ka titiro iho, o te pona o wairau e rere ana. Kia tau ki runga i a pare rāroa te whare whakaruru hau, ko te reo mai oha te rā, ko te arawaire e uri o nga te rāroa e ko koia e ara e, ko ana rulu te nei i koru roa tū nei ki a koutou katoa. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, just a, a little bit of a, a welcome to everyone who is joining this uh, Wānanga Ipurangi or this Hui Topa, uh, this webinar. Um, and to introduce myself, I'm Anaru Luke or Andrew Luke. I am the chair of the Kāhui Māori for the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge. And just to uh, um, and just help with the challenge and with the governance group in an advisory capacity with three others on the Kāhui uh, what it means to have a te ao Māori lens across this particular science challenge and in, in particular uh, to the Moana or Hini Moana, te au o te Moana, um, the voice of the ocean. So um, without further ado, I'd like to pass on to our, our lead and facilitator for this webinar, Chris Corneli Sen. Ke a koe, Chris. Marina and um, Kira Anarewa, thank you for um, the Karakia and your introduction. Um, yeah, so my name is Chris Cornelison. I'm based at the Cawthron Institute, and I've also had the pleasure of being on the challenge leadership team um, almost to the beginning of the challenge, really. So I've been involved for a number of years and currently look after the synthesis program. The webinar that you're participating in today uh, represents the final of a series uh, presented by Sustainable Seas. I believe there were six leading up to this one. And this one's fittingly at the end is, is what this one's about is how we as a challenge bring all the knowledge together um, to deliver on our objective. And the way we've structured the webinar today 
is I'm going to give you an introduction uh, to our synthesis program, uh, what it's about, how we've um, done some planning in this space, and how we intend to implement it over the last um, couple of years of, uh, of the challenge itself. And helping out in this webinar uh, will be our uh, strand leaders within the synthesis program. You'll be learning a little bit about each of those strands um, from Anne-Marie Schwartz, uh, Nick Lewis, Kane Tiapa, unfortunately, um, was unable to attend today. So Linda Faulkner will be presenting on his behalf. We also have Karen Fisher from the University of Auckland. We're fortunate also to have some of our stakeholders contributing to our webinar. And that includes Becky Shanahan with Hawks Bay Regional Council, as well as Kirsty Knowles from Department of Con Conservation. So we've structured into sort of two main components. The first one will be about our plan for synthesis. So you can all see what we've been um, designing in terms of what we'll be doing in the coming years. And then also then a second half around the topic of impact, okay, and, and how we might um, facilitate the synthesis research in a manner that, that delivers on our objective and more importantly, uh, delivers impact. And so we'll get into that discussion towards the end. I would encourage you in the chat, um, the chat will be turned off within 10 minutes, um, and then we'll have um, the Q&A box open, I believe, is where you can type in questions. And I'd encourage you to, to, to be thinking about questions in advance. We won't have the questions till the end. Uh, we'll have a panel form forum to, to answer those questions, but would encourage you to, to, to ask them. Um, so we ha can have some, some fruitful discussion towards the end of the webinar. Uh, so in that first half around the synthesis plan itself, um, you, you may just have to wait till the end after our discussion of impact to be able to ask them, but um, please, please, please do um, jot them down if you have them. So I thought what I'd do is um, first give an introduction to um, synthesis, the synthesis program itself. Um, essentially what it is, is the cross-cutting program. So we have four different research programs, or actually five with the underlying um, underpinning Tongaroa program, feeding into our four other ones around, uh, one around understanding degradation recovery, the one that Conrad Pillage leads, um, creating value from a blue economy um, that, that Nick Lewis leads, addressing risk and certainty, led by Judy Hewitt, and enhancing EVM practices uh, that Karen Fisher leads. And those are all feeding up through um, the synthesis program, which, which I lead. So it's really, you can almost think of it like a funnel. You know, we've been generating so much knowledge across the challenge, certainly creating impact within those individual programs. Um, but this is an opportunity to actually bring things together and deliver and focus on the challenge objective. Because after all, the National Science Challenges are mission-led. We are working towards achieving a particular objective. And for us, that's to enhance utilization of our marine resources within environmental and biological constraints. And so just a quick overview, um, apologies for all the text. Um, I have bolded a few key words, I think, that are important to synthesis. In terms of our aims, um, it really is about uh, integrating and communicating our research findings through fit for purpose output, output. So fit for purpose being the key words there. It's about producing new knowledge based on the research to achieve outcomes greater than the sum of the individual projects. Um, and it's also about building on what we've already done in the tool space, for instance, refining those tools and facilitating their wide use in future applications. So they actually have life beyond the challenge. So that relates to legacy. Um, and also providing pathways um, that could be things like roadmaps or how to's to implementing EVM. Um, how do businesses transition to a blue economy, for instance? And how do we empower Te Ao Maori approaches? Um, those are key. And an important thing, and um, Karen will be talking a bit about this in the webinar, is documenting what we've actually learned through the process within this national challenge and implementing the challenge to support future research activities. What worked well, what didn't work so well. It's important we take those learnings forward. Um, so two things that I wanna emphasize throughout this webinar is one around impact. So key to synthesis, and, and this would go true to any project that we have in the challenge, but delivering impact within um, synthesis is key. And so, so basically, you know, what does that look like? Um, it looks like, well, knowledge from the challenge being used to improve, you know, the health of our ocean, 
of our Moana and influencing marine management practice and policy. And I'll be giving some examples of that. It's also about Maori rights, interests, approaches, and values being recognized and supported through the application of EBM and also Te Ao Maori approaches by Maori. Uh, the value of the blue economy business models is also needing to be recognized and adopt, adopted. So that's also a sign of impact if we achieve that. We also have to encourage more inclusive, multi-sectoral decision-making practices and ensuring that those become adopted. Decision-making processes you know, that take account of cumulative effects from multiple activities is a real challenge. And that's, that's been a, a big focus of our biophysical research, for instance, and even our, our social research is around how do you deal with that issue where the ocean is effectively at the end of the pipe, if you will, and all sorts of activities are occurring in there. How do you actually manage for all those different effects that lead to those cumulative um, <clears throat> stressors? That the complementarity of Te Ao Maori approaches and EBM are well understood and enabled, and the decision-making processes explicitly identify and address both risk and knowledge uncertainty. So that's an that's emphasis of the program that Judy, for instance, leads. And the other thing I want to emphasize is that Synthesis is a lot about setting ourselves up for legacy. So life beyond the challenge, these challenges were, I think it was 10 or possibly, yeah, it was 10 years in duration. Um, so it does come to an end in 2024. So how do we make sure that, you know, the, the benefits and the impact of our work does um, go forward and is taken up and used? Um, so that's about creating momentum uh, pathways uh, for that long-term change. It's about ongoing accessibility to our data and knowledge. It's about developing capability in our early career researchers so they can become the practitioners and scientists of the future within an EBM and blue economy world, if you will. And it's profiling exemplars of practice in EBM, blue economy, as well as Te Ao Maori approaches. Um, I should mention that we'll be talking a lot about what's planned, but we have had synthesis underway um, for, for quite some time since phase one ended. And it really came about um, by the stakeholder panel, our governance group, as well as our ISP, the importance of actually getting our stuff out there, bringing it together and getting it out in, their, in, in some useful forms. Um, and so some of the work we have been, been doing in the background, Ursula Rojas Nazar has been working on, for instance, an EVM tools guide that'll be coming out shortly. That's a, a one-stop shop guide to what are the tools you know, that we have developed and what state are they in and where can they be applied? And we're also working on a research roundup on cumulative effects. So effectively, how far have we come in that space? What have we learned? So people can start getting on board now. We also have a number of what we call sort of EBM in action projects underway in regional areas, including Hawks Bay. You'll learn a bit more about that from Becky later in the webinar. Um, Vonda Cummings is leader, leading a regional project in the Marlboro Sounds. Both of those projects relate heavily to seabed health, for instance. We also have some projects um, in development um, in various stages of, of sort of progress. One in the EBFM space um, in collaboration with Fisheries New Zealand and their hockey golf. One working closely with the Waikato Regional Council on their coastal plan. And one collaborating with our land and water uh, national science challenge in MFV. And that's a catchment to sort of mountains to the sea type of a project. And what I'm gonna do now is just give you an introduction to the, to the plan that we've now recently um, landed on um, in these last few months on how we're gonna progress and really ramp up the synthesis research. And this, this plan is a culmination of a number of um, co-development uh, activities that we put in place, including things like stakeholder workshops, EWE workshops, um, input from um, interactions with the ISP, quite a lot of engagement among the challenge leadership team, um, engagement with our comms team, all sorts have contributed to this plan. Um, and it's an acknowledgement that synthesis really does have to be a team effort. It's not something that, for instance, I can just go off and, and do. It's something that actually requires us to work a bit differently. Um, it requires us to work at pace. It requires us to produce outputs that may not be um, uh, traditional science outputs, for instance. Um, so it is really an all hands to the pump um, approach. And the way we've structured this um, is according to different strands. Um, and right away you might think, oh, well, this, this is now just gonna silo things um, 
in a particular manner and prevent sort of the, the cross cutting stuff that needs to happen. But the way that we'll be working is, is developing our synthesis activities according to these strands, but coming together as a team often. And there's also some cross cutting activities that'll be happening across these strands. So the strands roughly follow our research programs, one in EBM, one in Blue Economy, one in Te Maori, and one, one covering that research process itself, um, which is quite critical. And so the idea is that we've already got a knowledge base to draw on within these strands, that we have some, some specific activities that we carry out within those strands. We have a bit more flexibility uh, you know, to get things underway quickly, um, take you know, advantage of opportunities that might be arising and so forth. And then that pink box at the end, that synthesis of synthesis, uh, is effectively what will be happening in the final year. However, we do need to get our ducks in a row now to ensure we really do um, some exceptional work in that final year in terms of bringing everything together. And we'll talk a bit more about that more um, when we talk about impact and what that might look like. So what I'm gonna do is now introduce Anne-Marie Schwartz. And so what we'll be doing is going through each of these strands and having each strand leader introduce themselves and some of those activities that will be um, taking place. So Anne-Marie, I'll invite you now into the webinar. Thank you, Chris. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Anne-Marie Swartz tōku ingoa. This synthesis strand addresses ecosystem-based management where EBM is defined as a holistic approach to managing human activities that ensures ecosystem health. And the challenge set out to develop an EBM approach that was uniquely tailored to the specific context of Aotearoa. And the seven principles of EBM that are shown here on this slide were identified by the challenge back in phase one. So this strand of the synthesis will focus on enabling and testing these principles with end users. And the overall aim of the strand is to synthesize the challenge research that can facilitate EBM being embedded within marine management and governance. Next slide, please, Chris. So in order to do that, four activities have been planned and you can see those on the right hand side of the slide of the slide. The first is the first activity is influencing policy and legislation. The second is titled end user analysis. The third in green scenario testing and the fourth titled guides and toolkits. And currently we're in what we're referring to as stage one. So this is this part of 2022 uh, heading towards the middle of the year. And un in stage one, there are activities under EBM1 and EBM2 that are underway now. So EBM1 is focused on contributing to current and upcoming reforms, such as the RMA reform process. For example, recently there was an activity to collate the challenge researchers learning about marine spatial planning in Aotearoa. And that was to pull together some material that can be used for such opportunities uh, as the reform process. Increasingly, it's anticipated that opportunities will be identified by end users and across the different strands. EBM2 is focused on end users. This will take a surveying and a gap analysis approach to identify current and potential end users that are beyond the current challenge co-development partners. And the aim here is to switch the emphasis from stakeholders as co-development partners to have a more detailed engagement with end users of the challenge research. There'll be future engagement opportunities identified through this process that'll form the basis for the third and the fourth activities in this strand. So looking briefly at EBM3, which is yet to um, start as part of the synthesis, this, activity addresses the question of whether decision making based on EBM principles and a blue economy can deliver enhanced use of the marine space and improved ecosystem health. In this activity, the aim is to test some scenarios of real or hypothetical cases across different scales, and those will be informed by co-development partners and end users. 
In EBM4, this is the how-to and the roadmap for EBM that Chris referred to. In this activity, tools and guidelines will be developed. Uh, the tools and guidelines that have been developed throughout the challenge will be assembled and packaged up with a practical end user focus. And this synthesis activity aims to provide a repository of knowledge to guide practical EBM decision making at multiple scales of management. Next slide, please, Chris. So the EBM strand will work synergistically with the other strands. For example, the Tao Māori strand has already begun to identify opportunities for cross-strand linkages, and you'll hear about that shortly. And that provides some practical entry points for the EBM strand moving forward. At the end of the synthesis, the EBM principles will have been scenario tested at multiple management scales with end users to identify how they can contribute to decisions that support improved ocean health. And the focus on end user needs aims to ensure that there will be maximum opportunity for uptake as part of this process and beyond. Kia ora, I'll now like to hand over to Nick Lewis. Koto. Um, I'm Nick Lewis. I'm the um, the theme lead of the Blue Economy uh, theme, um, and I'll be talking uh, to the, today largely on behalf of Joe Punch, who's been appointed uh, the strand leader of, of this particular theme, but only recently been appointed. So um, this will be the first and last time you hear me talking about the, the strand in this way. Um, the, the, the strand um, draws on our Blue Economy Research Programme and seeks to position it in relation to uh, the rest of the challenge, the research and the rest of the challenge, and synthesise uh, learnings from those, uh, from those different research um, programmes and agendas. Uh, just to familiarise you very quickly with the Blue Economy Research Programme, it takes advantage of the global and, and domestic interest in economic opportunities from uh, sustainable oceans, um, economic opportunities from sustainable oceans to approach the challenge of ensuring healthy oceans from the direction of doing economy differently within an EBM. And I think it's important uh, to keep thinking about that as we go through this, uh, this brief talk. Uh, for the challenge, it's, it's aspirational stuff, and we imagine a blue economy made up of marine activities that generate economic value and contribute positively to social, cultural, and ecological well-being. This interpretation of blue economy helps to make sense of the activities that make up this kind of theme. Uh, so we aim to take New Zealand from a marine economy that's understood as a of disparate and often um, exploitative uh, activities to a more coherent, uh, long-term sustainable uh, bl blue economy. And the, the model there on the slide suggests that the, the transition we imagine. Our core projects emphasize um, indigenizing a blue economy and building new sectors and rebuilding existing sectors within uh, EBM frameworks. Uh, the innovation funds that projects that are part of this are a mix of Mataranga Māori innovation projects, aquaculture focused innovation projects and technology driven projects, many of which um, overlap. Um, and I encourage you at some point to look those projects up and, and read through them. The Blue Economy Strand will bring together uh, this uh, economy focused research uh, with uh, Te Ao Māori and um, implementing EBM uh, research elsewhere in the challenge to produce impact uh, through indigenizing the blue economy, encouraging new investment um, and new sectors uh, and altered production and, re and regulatory or management practices. Next slide, please. So the, um, the, the, the strand activities that we, we have in mind to support this, um, this strand, um, I'll just briefly introduce them rather than uh, go through how uh, we are actually organizing our efforts. The first of these activities is to put some effort into uh, sustainability reporting and um, uh, come, uh, measuring and, and, and coming up with, with arguments for the blue economy premium that is associated with sustainability reporting. 
Um, so we imagine engaging with policy and business actors to promote sustainability reporting frameworks uh, and their values and to incorporate marine ecosystems into, into ongoing sustainability reporting initiatives. The uh, Task Force on Nature's Disclosures and the Task Force on Climate Change Disclosures, for example. Uh, we aim to draw on challenge research to assemble a knowledge base and test the measures required um, to actually contribute to these processes as well as um, help businesses respond um, to, to the processes as, as they are implemented in regulation and through, um, uh, through the directors of, of investors and insurers and so on. So we, we aim to work out what will work in New Zealand, uh, establish an expert panel to be able to uh, mediate between um, these new regulatory changes and changes um, in expectations from bankers, insurers and consumers um, and support businesses to uh, respond um, to these to these changes. Uh, we, and we will also incorporate BE principles into a value proposition for sustainability reporting. So it really is uh, to engage with a live ongoing set of processes, which we think we can have some impact um, through. The second will be to identify and apply a set of blue economy principles. So to bring together the research that has been done in the blue economy uh, theme and in the other themes within the challenge uh, to, to um, define and articulate uh, principles that might underlie uh, our, our aspirations for a blue economy and that uh, will then help businesses to um, recognize the value propositions associated with, with a blue economy, but also derive um, ways of, of implementing those, those principles and realizing those opportunities. Um, as part of this, we are going to mobilize a group of, of blue economy champions and develop value propositions for uh, for various end users. Uh, we also aim to, to develop a set of um, decision support tools associated with this. The third activity is to um, support ongoing initiatives to build a blue economy in place. So to bring the challenge research to bear on efforts that are ongoing or efforts that might be uh, emerging in regions and at local scales uh, among Hapu and, and, and Iwi to um, identify opportunities for building uh, new blue economies in place. Uh, and so we hope there to be able to leverage the blue economies, principles and the connections uh, among different activities um, that are going on in place. So this is a sense of, again, uh, a, an engagement in life processes and bringing the challenges, knowledge and research to bear. Next slide, please. Uh, the final slide here um, is if I were to try and represent this diagrammatically, each activity represents an area of intervention or potential impact where we can bring uh, together research initiatives from across the challenge to land the blue economy research and impact, uh, where impact is, is understood as, as some mix of, of new investment, new sectors and new practices, both um, within policy, but also uh, um, sustainable practices within um, within business. Um, each activity in effect becomes a platform for impact for doing marine economy differently and for realizing the aspirations of the challenge. We will do this by identifying and working with BE champions and synthesizing sustainable seas research, our BE projects and live initiatives in place. Uh, the strand will be led by Jody Kunch, who, as I suggested, is only just been appointed, but now is an opportunity, I think, for us to introduce Jody to you and for Jody to introduce herself and her role uh, to the group and, and where she sees uh, that going. So if we could hand over to Jody. Thanks, Nick, and kia ora katoa. Um, yes, I, uh, as Nick said, have just joined the challenge as a strand leader for the blue economy synthesis. And my role is really focused on um, helping that transition from for Aotearoa to transition into the blue economy. And within the chart that we have here is the role to facilitate and coordinate and really activate the outcomes from, um, from the challenge. And 
the key thing for for my role is to make sure that the impact lives um, in a very usable, achievable, viable way across the blue economy beyond um, just the length of the challenge that the tools are usable for businesses, for Māori, for communities, for investors um, uh, in the long term. And so I think my role is probably uh, slightly different than some of the other um, previous roles within the challenge is that it is very much an externally focused um, uh, role or a more externally focused role. Um, and so I'll be working um, together with Blue Economy Champions, um, other advisory groups to make sure that the pathways and the tools that do come from the challenge are um, applicable, applicable for Aotearoa, but also um, position us well to um, remain relevant and competitive in a global, um, in a global blue economy. So, um, I think that's it for me. Oh, did you want me to introduce myself as well? No. Um, yeah, so I, I, um, my background is largely in the seafood industry for about 15, 20 years working in the design and development and application of environmental and social and climate driven um, programs, both here in New Zealand and around the world. So I'm really keen to bring that into the challenge and, and remain connected with many of you that are, I can see are on the call. So I think that's it for me. Thanks, Nick. Oh, <clears throat> Ata Maria Kaito. Uh, uh, he Uriaho or uh, Te Kawi Maunga me te awa nui. <clears throat> uh, Nō reira e rere kawana te awa tupua mai i te Kawi Maunga ki tangaroa koe, te awa ko te awa koe. Kia ora. Um, my name is Linda Faulkner and I'm um, Deputy Director of Māori for Sustainable Seas and am um, replacing Kane Taiapa in the presentation of the Te Awa Māori strand of the synthesis um, program uh, as he's unable to, to um, join us unfortunately. So um, I guess just to um, build on what Anne-Marie and Nick have already described uh, and Chris, the Te Ao Māori strand is really about um, enhancing our collective relationship with the moana um, through the wisdom and guidance of um, our ancestors and um, the knowledge and experience we have in this place here in Aotearoa. Um, in terms of the wero, across the top of the um, slide there, the, the wero or the challenge or, within this strand is really about moving from um, a situation where we are able to provide space for Māori ways of knowing, thinking and doing um, in both our research and in marine management to a place where um, Māori are, are able to lead more of their own ways of knowing, thinking and doing um, within their own rohe moana. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. So in terms of the Te Ao Māori Synthesis strand, there are five activities. And as Anne-Marie um, pointed out earlier, um, the connection between each of the strands is going to be incredibly important to producing products from the challenge um, that are fit for purpose for various audiences, various end users. And the Te Ao Māori strand in particular uh, has a, a, a very close and boundary crossing relationship with the other two strands, the EBM and Blue Economy strands. So the five activities within the Te Ao Māori synthesis strand um, cover a, a range of different things. Um, tu hono hono, um, the tu hono hono activity is really about providing guidance about how to establish and apply Māori values and not just research but in policy and legislation um, and, the, and a process for defining and achieving a shared vision for the moana uh, across different types of partnerships. Uh, te Waka Taurua <clears throat> uh, really aims to draw together the insights from across challenge uh, kaupapa Māori or Māori focused projects to understand what the EBM principles mean and look like through a Māori lens, through a te ao Māori lens, um, which will be an important part of this uh, strand of activities. Uh, he taura here, that activity is really about developing a framework that supports how we connect across um, the different 
uh, areas of research through the challenge and particularly in the synthesis. So really drawing everything together as the strand design in the slide represents. Uh, while Atua Te Aro Te Aotearoa is about alternative indigenous economies and values involved with the understandings inherent in, in alternative indigenous economies and how they can contribute um, to a national discourse moving forward. And then Mana Motu Hake is really about um, developing a roadmap of sorts to support the transition from Māori participating in marine management to meaningfully partnering in marine management and supporting them to govern in marine management um, in their own rohe. Next slide, please. So synthesis within the Te Māori strand essentially operates as a, as a connector and a facilitator between um, the challenges partners and end users um, who've been involved in projects or who um, in the in the Māori focus projects of the challenge have actually led them. Um, so being a, a connector and a facilitator uh, across the breadth of chal the challenges, research findings and products. So synthesis will occur at various sites in this, uh, for the Te Ao Māori strand uh, across this landscape between our project partners, the projects themselves, and then the breadth of what's going on across the challenge. Um, to meet the needs of a variety of audiences, um, including principally iwi, hapu, and Māori entities, both commercial and customary. Next slide, please. In terms of a bit of a time frame, um, there's kind of essentially three chunks of, of work occurring across the time frame we have. Um, the first is really about pulling all of the necessary people, research, and knowledge together from across the challenge and uh, with our partners. <clears throat> Approximately a third of the challenge's researchers are Māori and um, almost half of our projects are led or partnered by Māori. So bringing all of those together to work in the synthesis strand will be um, incredibly important. The second chunk of work is really a, about um, integration, um, bringing the insights to come out of our work and the insights held by our knowledge holders um, together, um, including obviously with our partners and end users. And then the last chunk, Ngahua, um, or the fruits, is really about that um, producing outputs and products that support our various audiences achieve greater connection and relationship with the moana. So that, in a nutshell, um, sums up the Te Ao Māori strand, uh, although Kane probably would have delivered it much more eloquently than myself. Um, I'll now hand over to Karen Fisher, who's going to talk about the research process work. Kia ora, Linda. Um, so, called Karen Fisher Toko Ingoa. Um, I am the theme leader for the Enhancing EBM Practices theme, and I'm also based at the University of Auckland, and I'll be giving an overview of the research process strand, which is the um, final strand in the synthesis plan. And um, the, the, the research process strand is primarily focused on the challenge itself and the, the lessons that we can, that we've learned along the way in um, as the, the challenge has matured over the, the past, well, it'll be over the, the phase one and phase two. So it focuses on synthesizing and documenting the research um, and that was undertaken by looking at the transition from multidisciplinary research focused primarily on academic outputs in phase one to transdisciplinary research focused on real world impacts in phase two. And the starting point for the, the strand is that on the activities within the strand, is that the challenge has provided an opportunity to undertake research and knowledge production uh, differently by bringing uh, together a diverse array of researchers and co-development partners with different backgrounds and ex expertise for the purpose of enhancing the implementation of EBM and of blue economy practices. So the research will analyze the challenge across both of the phases in terms of how the challenge has engaged with those operating in the marine space, the, the efforts undertaken to accommodate diverse values, knowledges and interests, and also what um, 
has generated the shift from research that was primarily researcher driven to research that emphasized the co-development, uh, to research that emphasized co-development and that better reflected the needs of end users. Next slide, please. So there are two research activities within this strand, uh, Academia to Impact and Mataranga in Science. The Academia to Impact has just gotten underway in recent weeks, and um, this will involve documenting the transition from academic oriented research to end user oriented research and the shift from multidisciplinary to transdisciplinary research practice and, and the, um, the way in which co development practices have been incorporated into phase two research. So, this will entail looking at the kinds of research outputs that we've produced, the way in which um, the researchers have. Um, performed their research activities and then trying to track the different factors that have led to, to this shift or this evolution in the way in which the research has been undertaken. The second activity is Mataranga in Science, and this is due to commence later in, in 2022. This research activity will look to document the challenges attempts to try and seek out the many voices of science in Mataranga to enable new knowledge to be produced and the, the various attempts that have been undertaken through the challenge research to amplify mātauranga expertise and experts. So in doing this, we'll look to understand and analyse um, how the voice of the moana has been or could be centred by um, including these more diverse scientific and mātauranga voices. The activity will also consider efforts to bring mātauranga to science. Next slide, please. So as with the other uh, strands that have already been discussed, this, this research uh, process strand is also seeking to focus its impacts, uh, focus its outputs on delivering impact. And we've identified a range of different end users that um, we will look to target. And, and targeting these outputs, they will, the, 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 the content and the type of output will vary. So we, um, the, the nature of the outputs will largely be guidance based on the experiences and lessons that we've learned from the challenge. And these are lessons relating to working across different knowledge systems, um, seeking to engage uh, Māori and other diverse communities into um, more sort of, uh, into various sort of decision-making processes as well as into research itself. And then what we've learned from co-development. And, and we, we see, the potential to have an impact at a range of different levels from the community through to the research community. So we've identified um, the national and international research community as an end user and um, the kinds of advice or guidance that we would have in, in that space would be tailored towards that particular audience. So it's really focused, our outputs we focus on um, ensuring that we can provide guidance and and show what to do and what not to do based on our own experiences. And um, with that, I'll hand that uh, back over to Chris and to talk about delivering impact. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> and thank you to the other strand leaders for your presentations. Thanks, Linda, for filling in for Kane. I thought you did a great job. Really appreciate that. Um, we're now gonna shift our webinar into the topic of delivering impact in relation to our synthesis efforts. Um, and we'll be having a few of the uh, stakeholders contributing to this section. Um, should, I should just quick mention though that uh, the plan, that the information that was just um, delivered is, is quite dense. There's a lot of stuff in there. And if you need to get more details, well, you can certainly watch this webinar again, but you can also go to our website uh, where we should have uh, the, the synthesis plan there. Uh, that you're able to, to access. Uh, just on the topic of, of impact, so again, I, I emphasize that these, you know, these challenges do come to an end in 2024, and we want to maximize the impact that our, um, our challenge delivers. Of course, we've chosen an, an ambitious topic of ecosystem-based management, which is often described as a journey, right? So it's going to be happening well beyond the life of the challenge. And also the blue economy, of course, you can think of that as an aspiration rather than an actual thing, but we should be moving towards that direction. And so key in these, these final two years is that we deliver impact. And something I thought I'd start with is just some of the characteristics um, that will be quite important for our outputs to have as we progress through the, the various strands and their activities. 
Um, and it's, it's quite clear from where we have seen some success and some impact is that the outputs we are producing um, do need to be valued by the end users in order to be taken out. They do absolutely need to be fit for purpose, otherwise they won't use them, for instance. And also understanding who your end users are, and Karen just touched on that point of targeting outputs to the right people. Um, and of course, pathways to implementation. Um, and Anne-Marie talked a bit about roadmaps, for instance, for EBM uh, being quite important. Um, and tailoring things, translating things, you know, um, for multiple end users, um, and also thinking about end user testing. You know, we often go off as scientists and might develop something, but it, it might go off the wrong path. So it's, we constantly have to calibrate uh, with the end users that we're on the right track. Absolutely, our outputs need to be easily accessible, right? Easy to find, user friendly, and applicable and usable at different scales. That's what we're finding is from the local, uh, regional, or even national scale, depending on the issue. And rolled out beyond the end users directly involved. So this relates to transferability, wide transferability um, for all of New Zealand and beyond globally, even. Uh, and just to, before we move on to um, Becky and to um, Kirsty, I thought I'd just give a, a few examples of where we've, we've seen some real impact and, and pull out some of those um, characteristics of these projects that help lead to that impact and success. And one of the activities, activity one in the EBM strand is about taking advantage of things that are happening right now in policy and legislation. And, getting in there and helping where we can as a challenge based on the knowledge we're generating. And a good example is the National Policy Statement for Fresh Water and implementation of limit setting, for instance. And what are the implications of that, say, on downstream estuaries, which is um, a very complex thing, as we know, because of the cumulative effects that occur from multiple stressors um, in estuaries. And so this was a body of research um, that we did within Sustainable Seas that was um, reasonably fast paced, got in there um, and basically put research um, coming out of tipping points into action, all right? So help translate the findings into user-focused guidance and summaries so it was accessible um, and identify the best ways to deliver them. For instance, we did a council roadshow um, with that knowledge and that, that proved to be quite impactful and timely and timing was everything in that case. Um, another really good example, and you would have heard this um, in an earlier webinar from Megan Ranapia, um, is a project led by Kura Paul Burke. Um, we, we often use this as one of our um, shining star examples of impact. And this Afi Mai Afi Atu, or enacting a Kaitiaki Tanga based approach to EBM, um, is a project up in Ohiwa Harbor, okay, where you have the 11 armed sea stars having an impact on shellfish populations number of factors leading to that. Um, and looking at the feasibility of using natural fiber aquaculture lines to help restore Kutai beds without, um, for instance, plastic pollution, for instance. But the key here is that this was co-developed from the beginning um, with Iwi, all right? Uh, which helped light lead to, to the success and impact. And the fact that they're actively involved um, and it includes hands-on participation, as well as capacity building, for the next generation. So inclusion of Maori students, for example. So that's that's been a very successful project uh, because it had those sorts of characteristics within it. And I'd probably just add that we've done a lot of work with the development of tools. Uh, so when I, when I say tools, I mean in the broadest sense. So that could be a framework, um, for instance, for, for enabling participatory processes, it could be a monitoring method or standardized approaches to how you might monitor estuaries. Um, it could be something as simple as this graphic that Ursula helped um, construct with our communications team around key marine legislation, for instance, which is actually popping up all over the place, um, or, or the work emerging some of, out of some of our blue economy uh, work, for instance, in, in thinking about New Zealand seaweed sector and what that might look like and helping enable that. Um, through the development of frameworks, or even our, our plastic tracker that Sustainable Seas developed. Um, that, that underlying code is being used in lots of different types of models, helping us understand connectivity among different water bodies. And I thought a nice next segue would be for um, Becky Shanahan to pre um, present now 
on how some of these sorts of tools are being used on the ground in a region to help implement EVM. So I'm gonna invite Becky on now, who's gonna present on the project up in Hawks Bay. Kira Koto, Ko Becky Shanahan Toku Inga, and I'm a, a senior scientist at the Hawks Bay Regional Council. And um, I figured I'd kind of give everyone a bit of a quick rundown of what our study is, because I'm not sure that everyone knows what it is. Um, and then a little bit of what we're working towards and hoping to get out of it at the end. Um, so we've been working with the Sustainable Seas Challenge since 2018 as part of our stakeholder group, the Hawks Bay Marine and Coast Group, um, which I'll explain in a second. Um, and so this project has been a collaborative project over the last four years now. Um, and we're not quite there yet, but we're getting nearing the end, which is pretty exciting actually. And we're seeing some pretty cool outputs. Um, next slide, please, Chris. So the Hawks Bay Marine and Coast Group, which I will refer to as HBMAC from here on out because that's a bit of a mouthful to say <laughs> over and over. Um, it was formed in 2016 and it was formed because members of Legacy wrote a letter to the council saying that the, um, there was a perceived depletion of inshore fin fish stocks and a general environmental degradation in the coastal marine area in Hawks Bay. So there's quite a, a social momentum for change in Hawks Bay. Um, if you could just advance the slide, Chris. And the membership over time has grown. Um, it includes local government, obviously, and national government um, agencies. There's also Tonga to Fenua, there's commercial fishing interests, there's recreational fishing interest, and um, there's some local industry that's also recently joined. If you could advance the slide, Chris. And um, in 2018, the group created this uh, research roadmap to highlight areas of knowledge that are really lacking in the Bay and what, what research needs to be undertaken in order to answer some of those questions. And an important feature of this group is that it's not a decision-making group. So no one in the group has decision-making powers. The group is purely to come together to really try and get as much information as possible to feed into policy decision um, and just provide as much background as possible. So that's sort of the main focus. Um, if you could advance the slide, please. So the vision of the group, as outlined in the research roadmap, is to achieve a healthy and functioning marine ecosystem in Hawks Bay that supports an abundant and sustainable fishery. And if you advance the slide again, um, I've put the objective and vision of sustainable seas, and you've heard it many times, of course, over the last half an hour. So um, you can see that they clearly align, you know, the goals of HBMAC and the goals of sustainable seas. If you could go to the next slide, please. So what's the benefit for the HBMAC group is a pretty obvious question. So we know as a group what we know. We know as a group what we don't know and we can find out, which is what the research roadmap really highlights. But we don't know what we don't know. And um, we also don't know the information that can support the the final step from going from the research to the policy and how we best feed that information. Um, so if you could just advance the slide and again. So the Sustainable Seas actually provides us with the opportunity to access um, the specialists in the field to help us bridge those gaps and answer those questions that we don't actually know. Um, next slide, please. So the case study is, uh, it kind of makes sense here in Hawks Bay, one, because of the um, social pressure that exists already and a very keen um, group of marine users in the Bay. Um, and also at the time when this project was started, Stuart Nash was the fisheries minister. And so there was um, a little bit of political pressure as well and, and interest in general. So um, this project is a, was two years, but has gone up to four with COVID, as I'm sure many projects have, have experienced along the way. It's been co-developed with the HBMAC group the entire way, and um, our agency and all the other agencies provide in-kind support um, 
so that we can facilitate this project as best as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So we did the project in two pieces. So the first part of the project was developing a systems map. And so the systems map basically identified goal gaps in our ecosystem. So that's where you're not at your desired state yet. Um, you're at some other state and trying to figure out, you know, what you want that desired state to be. The group met early with sustainable seas and decided that the two main stressors on the marine environment that they were really keen to look into were sediment inputs from the land and disturbance on the seafloor, particularly from trawling and bottom contact. So that was sort of the anchor points of the map. And if you could just advance the... So this is a picture of the map. I left it small on purpose. Um, there's literally no intention for you to read this or understand it because it's quite complicated as you can see. Um, the map kind of splits into three pieces. So the left-hand side of the map really delves into the sediment input from the land and how they get there and the amount of sediment that gets into the land. The middle is about the benthic structure, the health, um, the recovery from impacts, um, that sort of aspect of it. And then on the right-hand side, it talks about uh, the map focuses on um, the sort of impacts from the social impacts more from the health of the benthic structure as a whole. And the map for us um, as you know, council staff was super informative in that it kind of opened our eyes a bit to some of the other processes and decisions and factors that weigh in on the decisions that the members of the group make when they're when we're discussing certain things. I think it was eye opening for a little bit of everyone in the group in different ways. Um, and the group has been very engaged the entire project, which has been really great. So, um, so this map was a huge collaborative effort and was definitely really revealing to everyone sort of how um, crazy this web is and how what everyone's really thinking about when they're making decisions, you know, that something that's potentially important to you is actually not nearly even on someone else's radar at all. Um, so if you could advance the slide. And then the next part of the project was to um, use a model that was used in the first phase of the challenge, the disturbance and recovery model. And it allowed us to test those two main stressors that the group was interested in. So um, changes in sediment, if it was reduced by a certain amount or in a certain area, by a certain time, what would that mean? Um, or if bottom contact um, trawling was reduced here or there, same kind of thing by a certain date or certain amount. So the disturbance recovery model allowed us to test how the benthic structure would recover from um, those impacts if they were changed. And then the final piece of that puzzle is to then take the model and put it through the map and see, you know, so benthic structure changed this much closer to its desired state. What does that mean in the flow through of, you know, community well-being, nutrition needs being met, all of that kind of stuff. So um, that was stage two. So if you could advance the slide. So the um, this is kind of the same thing in a bit of a pictorial format. So um, the bottom left image is the co-developing of the management interventions and scenarios. So uh, basically the group got together and came up with a group of scenarios where they had to decide how much sediment they wanted, um, how much of a reduction of sediment they wanted over time. And um, and what kind of changes in fishing. And they did three different scenario options of how they would change that in the future. And then um, our lovely uh, model builders and runners at NIWA incorporated all of our crazy ideas into the disturbance and cover recovery model, um, which is so simply summed up in that picture, although I know it's a much more complex process than that. Um, and then they provided us with the results, which are really cool. So then just, Two weeks ago, we had our a workshop where we went through the results and actually looked at how the benthic structure affected um, the next pieces in the systems map. I won't share the results of that because the group itself hasn't actually had any time to debrief. We're actually having a meeting this week to debrief on 
what they got from that, but there was um, there was a lot of really positive conversation about um, what they the just sort of the impacts that they saw, how long it takes. There's a lot of conversation about the delay that it takes for not only for benthic structure to recover, but also for social change to happen in a meaningful way. Um, so I think there's quite a bit for the group to sort of mull over and have conversations about. And the next sort of step to EBM is then taking this information and sort of navigating these different values to making a policy. So that's that's sort of the next step that's on the group's, the group's radar for sure after this. Um, if you just wanna advance the slide. So yeah, where to from here? So a big part for us um, is that the H3 Mac group was engaged and that they felt heard over the course of the process. So, so far they've been very actively involved the whole time through, which has been really great. Um, and I think we've all learned a lot from each other, which is great. And I think the benefit of this group in particular is that because they had such a strong foundation before the project, they're all really keen to get something out of it together, which is great. Um, we're also, we want to get a better understanding about multiple and overlapping stressor effects. That's a common thread that you've heard today as well. Um, and also for us, it's important to get a better understanding of the flow on impacts from some of these management decisions in terms of a socio-ecological context, because sometimes that's kind of left out of the process, although it's extremely important and really drives how people value the sea and engage with the sea and engage with the policies that we're making. So we're hoping that the information from this project will feed into our um, Kotahi plan change. So we're doing a plan change into an all-in-one plan in the next few years. And so the information that we get from this project is um, definitely beneficial towards that process. Um, I think that's, that's it for me. So um, thank you very much for your time. And I'll pass over to Kirsty Knowles from DOC. Kia ora koutou, ko Kirsty Knowles tōko ingoa, e mahi ana ahau ki te tare a te papa atawhai ki te whanganui a tāra. Ko ki te kai maitanga mātai, ahau moana tōko mahi. So hello everybody, I'm Kirsty. I work for, I have the privilege of working for te papa atawhai, the Department of Conservation. Um, you can tell from the accent, I'm originally from the UK. I've been in New Zealand about 15 years as soon as I put my feet down. Um, that was it, the roots were down. Um, I, like many of my colleagues in central government, work there for the reason that we're really, really passionate about making a difference and making sure that we do genuinely sustainably look after our oceans and that we do that in partnership with others. Um, I have been in my role for the last two years. Um, previously, I worked in the international team um, and do have to say, and I know you guys know this already, but one of the things coming into New Zealand that is so special and what is really so spe special about this challenge is that we're in a unique position in New Zealand that there's a really, really good network, there's good accessibility to the expertise, um, the ideas, the innovation, and Sustainable Seas really does provide that, that house, that umbrella in which to bring it all together. So we... Um, I, in my role at Papa Atafai, um, have the focal point role for the Sustainable Seas National Challenge. Um, I'm part of the stakeholder panel and I facilitate a conversation within DOC, but also with my colleagues across government. So there are a number of dialogues that happen. You will have heard about the Ocean Secretariat, which was relatively new under the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, and so the perspective that I'm bringing is not just the Kirsty show, it is um, a perspective that has been discussed and talked about amongst um, colleagues in central government. Next slide, please, Chris. So I'm probably gonna be the one that's gonna share some free and franks and some blunt messages, um, but I'm all for leaning into sometimes some of the difficult conversations. Um, Phase one, everybody jumped on board. Uh, lots of really, really, really great work that was done. But overall, uh, what was reported back um, 
is this sense of kind of disappointment, I guess, that the work that was done in wasn't as applied in nature, didn't impact policy, wasn't as useful to uh, policy, policy analysts as much as was hoped. And that created a fair degree of kind of mental models, I guess. Um, so going into phase two, um, we have jumped in boots and all a lot more actively to try and work with the challenge, its partners, the researchers to help really explain ourselves, what is it that we actually need? What are some of those tools? What are some of those outputs? Instead of grumbling from the outside to be quite clear about the projects that are gonna be of real value to us and some of the outputs that are gonna be of real value to us. Um, and it's particularly, you know, one of the big bits of feedback has been the co-governance, co-design approach of the challenge in phase two that directly talks at least for um, to Papa Atafai, um, our obligations under Titariti or Waitangi, our section four obligations under the Conservation Act. So that's been really, really great to see. And it's a, it's a space in which we're working more and more and more to get right. Um, and across the themes of phase two, it's also been really exciting for central government. So, you know, the Tangaroa themes, what does co-design look like? What are those perspectives? As I said, section four, it's what we're all about. So that's been really great to be listening, learning um, as part of that journey. The degradation and recovery stream of work. You know, for a long time, um, particularly my role in the international team, New Zealand's a real advocate for cumulative impact assessment. Those three words were kind of something that we constantly tried to put into international negotiations and language. But how? How do you do that? What does that look like? How do you translate that? The blue economy, likewise, wanting to enable industry to develop at a time when we've got a climate and a biodiversity crisis. Where is the real value? Where are the opportunities to really be made? Um, the risk and uncertainty theme. We all know, you know, management action, decisions are made based on the, the quality of the data that you put in. You put in rubbish data to something, models will spit out some rubbish results. So we always deal in a huge um, space of risk, of uncertainty, but how best to do that? So really found some good value in some of those spatial planning tools that are coming out at the moment. It's all about spatial planning at the moment. That's how we have to actually deliver on EBM is to work holistically, think about all of the users and work together. So looking at some practical tools to take us through those conversations, take us through those complexities is, is gonna be exciting. And then lastly, of course, it's all about EBM. Um, it's been great to be able to think about that and apply some of the challenge learnings and project in the sea change space in the Hauraki Gulf. Um, our development of Ahimuana, you know, working with communities at place, it's not a new concept, but we've picked it up as central government hearing how important and how critical that is. But still across phase two, I guess, Central government works at such pace, there's such high expectations for delivery, policy change, uh, decisions now, tomorrow. There's still some mental models about, you know, there's great investment here in the challenge, but it's slow. What are the outputs? How do we actually translate that? How do we actually turn that into something meaningful and pick it up? Not a detailed technical science publication, uh, not a big report, but something crunchy, concise. Those tables that Chris showed before, some of those infographics are, are gold for us. Lots of the conversations we've, we've been part of, there's, there's real focus on the why some of these concepts are important and the theory, but what we really, really need is that how, those how ideas. So next, last slide, please, Chris. So I guess the, the, what Chris has outlined already, and we're definitely on board as well, is that we're seeing this synthesis component of the challenge as the real key opportunity to bring it all together to be transformational. It's, it's all well and good, as you well know, to do some really great mahi, have some great conversations. 
but how do we translate that into actually making a difference on the ground, be that the bottom-up approach, be that us as central government providing some top-down governance and guidance. Um, what we're really looking for the challenge to help us do through the synthesis phase is to do that in a way, as is the bullet points here, that's gonna translate the urgency for action. That's really important doing that sell um, for us and translating that, it's got to happen soon, but how? So application, applied science, roadmaps, how we can actually get to that endpoint, tools, guidance, um, really, really concise, the more concise, the better. My policy colleagues are forever saying, yeah, it sounds really great what's happening in the challenge, but I need that two page document or that real concise summary of guidance that we can pick up and drop in. Um, so that's, I guess, the plea from um, colleagues across central government and a big, big thank you to everybody that has input it into the challenge so far. But yeah, this, this is our time now through this synthesis to really bring it together. And we look forward to, to working with you in shaping and doing that. Kia ora. <clears throat> Kia ora, Kirsty, and, and thank you, Becky. Um, great contributions and a great lead in to our QA and a and this panel discussion. Um, I'm going to stop screen share in a moment. We'll be able to see everyone's faces. Um, I see some questions have come through already. I have a few probably questions that I'd like to start with, but please, um, yeah, don't be shy. I think um, People have given us a lot of food for thought, um, some, some good sort of material to, to stimulate some questions. So, so yeah, please get them in there. There's a few in there already, but I might um, go to stop share now and hopefully our panel participants will come on up. There they are. If you turn on your videos, that'd be great. I'll try not to put people yeah, on the spot too much here. But I think um, I liked uh, Kirsty's point about having frank conversations. And I mean, we're dealing with really difficult, complex issues here, um, societal issues um, and trying to use science as well in, that, in those sorts of frameworks. And I do, I guess I would lead off a question, maybe this is for Kirsty or maybe Becky or, or, or some of the strand leaders or CLT is, um, you know, what is the best way to engage and influence, if you will, say, say in a central government context or even regional government, how do we best work together so we can produce tools and deliver them, but how do we actually do it in a way that in that final year of the challenge, we're actually delivering things together that will enact that change? Um, I, can, I can start if you want, Kirstie. <laughs> Um, so I would say in our experience, what we've seen is um, the, the social driving here has been a huge part of our success, that the community is very keen and they want to be involved and they want to see change. Um, and from us as a council staff perspective, we have sort of like I was saying, we have the information um, that we don't know and are learning or that we've gotten from the challenge, but we really need that gap between the model results and even seeing it through the map to the actual policy input. What you were saying, Kirsty, essentially, we need that, that gap in the middle. That's the last sort of piece of the puzzle that would help us sort of make this all go full circle, I think. Yeah, and I guess just to, to add, I think it's part of the journey. And being part of the journey together helps us in telling the story. And being in a science team for central government, that's part of our role too, is how do you translate the good work that's being done here with our colleagues that are time poor, don't have time to sit through all the webinars, lap up all of the conversations, all the, all the really rich stuff. And it is those tools, it is those summarized outputs that are quite crunchy, quite concise, that is best for them. But then we need to step up too and make sure that we are selling that value at the same time. So it's kind of a two pronged approach, I think. Thank you. 
I think I'll add one from the, the Q and A coming in. Um, Emma Lynette Hoey has has asked something similar around the topic of engagement, but in this case with Hapu. How do Hapu engage to implement the Teo Maori synthesis? Um, and she uses an example of, of dealing with Calerpa seaweed, for example. So um, I suppose I can jump in here. Um, thank you, Emma, kia ora for the question. Um, yeah, it's it's a difficult one. The, what the research undertaken and the challenge to date in the Te Māori space um, has been very centred in place for obvious um, reasons. And um, what we're doing in synthesis is, I suppose, bringing together the learnings from all of those very tailored in place uh, pieces of work um, and providing, I suppose, models or um, templates or tools that other iwi and hapu can pick up and use um, to achieve their specific aspirations in place. So, um, in terms of your specific request around, you know, actually looking for an avenue to be able to um, have a cultural impact assessment pulled together to document um, the, the whānau, hapu, mā tauranga, um, relevant to the um, seaweed. Um, yeah, that's, it's, a, it's always a challenge finding sources of um, resource to help groups achieve those things. Um, but hopefully what will come out of the synthesis work and the challenge more generally um, are sources of information and data and models that the, that the whānau can pick up and use to be able to do pieces of work like that. So probably not kind of the answer you were looking for, but hopefully a helpful one. Thank you, Linda. Um, I've had a question come through or a topic come through from Mitch Ford on the list here. We've had some previous discussions around sort of problem solving and, and solutions. And, you know, the classic way for scientists, I guess, to, to do things sometimes is to come up with a solution and then go look for a problem to, to solve with it. Um, and I guess the question, um, he's sort of directing it to me, but I'd like to pose it to the wider group here as well is that how do we work differently maybe within these strands, within synthesis to approach it, sort of flip it on its head? Maybe we should be looking at, well, where is the problem? And then looking in our toolbox and then looking for the best way to solve that problem using our suite of tools. Um, and so, you know, question, well, what are the most appropriate tools then to apply? And has, has that sort of idea been adopted anywhere in the challenge where we've taken that approach? I'm not sure if anyone wants to chime in there. I guess I would just answer um, Richard's uh, question with um, the point that, you know, some of these regional studies are, are more or less taking that approach, that we've gone into these regions where the problems actually are very similar. Like if you look at Hauraki Gulf or you look at Marlboro Sounds or what's happened in Tasman Golden Bays and so forth, we have an issue with well, to be honest, the marine environment due to multiple stressors. So then that's where I think what needs to happen and some of our synthesis products are doing this is helping the end users, the decision makers, iwi and so forth, understand what is in that toolbox. What can they be used for? Can they be tweaked? Can they be enhanced? Whatever it is to help answer the, the, the right questions, if you will, around that problem so that we can then solve it appropriately. So I'm not sure if that fully answers your, your question, Rich. Hopefully it does. But I do think we, we need to work differently in synthesis. Do, does any of the panel members have any thoughts on how we might work differently, the, different to how we've already worked in the challenge, like in some of these activities? I think it's in part, I don't know whether it's the same for the challenge, but it's certainly something we talk about a lot at Papa Atafai. It's almost like you need a, a comms plan for each of these kind of projects. Be really clear about your users and looking back on phase one or looking across more to work, other work, what tools have really resonated with those end users and to be 
communicating and sharing those as examples of what could work well. And it, it, it is a comms task to translate science into policy and to user groups on the ground. Communities will want a different looking tool. So I think it's, it is about having those conversations about what's really needed at place, what works for people at place, what works for people at regional council, what works for people at central government is all different. And therefore you need to invest in the time to make sure that that output is, is targeted. Thank you, Kirsty. Does anyone else want to add anything? I would just say what you were saying before, if there's knowledge about tools that can be tweaked, you know, if, if you see something and you think, oh, that's not going to work for me, I guess I can't use it, is a bit um, something that might put people off. But if you know that this is a tool that can be adaptable to my needs, I think that's a big, that's important. Thank you. Okay, questions are coming in thick and fast. So I'm trying to concentrate to what you guys are saying and read questions at the same time. So not very good at the multitasking. Um, this is an interesting one from Erica Gregory. Uh, and maybe, maybe Karen might be able to help with this. Um, so some of the learnings and case studies um, that, they're find, that they think would uh, be helpful to understand more about are around how co-design or co-development processes were facilitated and resourced. So how is that aspect being communicated to agencies and others, not just say biophysical knowledge, but how, the, how you would actually go through those processes? Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Erica. I think um, that is um, what Erica has sort of alluded to there is the kinds of things that we are wanting to do in the research processes strand, but I'd, I'd also, um, as, as the strand um, leaders were saying, there's so much um, connection between the different strands. So obviously there's an aspect of needing to think about um, the learnings from the EBM strand as well as the Te Ao Māori strand. So my short answer, Erica, is we're intending to put together, um, you know, guidance of want of a better word and just listening to what Kirsty has just said, thinking about what is useful at different levels that would be able to provide some insights or some lessons learned about co-design and co-development. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Karen. I think that was a good answer. Um, I'll, I'll check one out there. Um, and this one relates to early career researchers and capacity development. I think that's some something that Challenge can be proud of that we've developed a lot of early career researchers from, from our programs. Um, and that should continue through synthesis. And I guess how, how might our activities in synthesis contribute to further developing, whether it's science, so beyond even early career. So scientists, practitioners, communicators, even business leaders um, needed for tomorrow, you know, tomorrow in EVM and BE, how do we actually engage them in a way that we start developing that capacity or expertise amongst the activities we're doing? Does anyone have any thoughts around that? You know, secondments come to mind, you know, things like that. So Chris, this is something um, Julie and I just talked about at our recent regular catch up. And I think it is about creating that space for exactly that at different, different levels, different stakeholders where we are able to bring on board um, some of these uh, youth research advisors um, to help us with that translation component uh, between the different groups to see experience what the issues are and advise back. So secondments, internships, um, all, all of the above, I think, are a really, really good idea. Um, it's just a case, let's just get on with it. And those that are able, stick your hand up and let's get on with it. Thank you, Kirsty. Does anyone else want to add to that question around capacity building? We sort of have no, no shortage of um, projects that we'd love to get some help with. <laughs> so to be honest, the more capacity out there, the happier we will be. Great. Um, I should mention, Becky, that there's a number of questions coming in about your the project in Hawks Bay. 
Some of them are quite specific, and I would encourage you to reach out to Becky or Carolyn and, and Anna and others involved with the project. Catherine's asked, asked a few more detailed ones about it. Um, for instance, um, you know, how did some of the modeling, you know, how, how did some of the participants respond to the modeling, modeling, like in particular mediated modeling? You know, what was the entire cost of the project? You know, things like that. Are you able to just give a quick, quick sort of synopsis of how people have been responding and also um, sort of what the broad brush, brush amount of implementing that has been and, and, and what that might look like for other regions? Yeah, sure. Um, the The budget for the project doesn't include the in-kind support aspect of things. So there has been quite a bit of, of project team background preparation and stuff that um, potentially isn't included in that total. Um, how much, I don't know that I could say off the top of my head, because um, I'm not sure how the funds are split between the two halves of the project. That might be a question more for Carolyn to answer than for me. But um, yeah, in terms of the the group's um, engagement with the process, we've put quite a bit of time into making the model results digestible and um, understandable and giving them lots of opportunity to re-engage, ask questions when they don't know, you know, if something doesn't look familiar. For us, we talk in graphs, you know, and they may not all speak in graphs. So there's been quite a bit of effort and time putting into making sure the communication, like you were saying, Kirsty, to the group is actually what they need to hear and the points that we need them to hear from, so from the model output. So in general, it's been pretty good. They're, they're pretty on board with it. And they're frank with us when we're going over their head. Great, thank you. Um, we're, we're running low on time here. So I'm just gonna throw a quick one out here. Keep in mind that all the Q&A um, questions will be shared with the whole panel. Um, so I noticed Ham Hamish Rainey and Catherine Short, a few others, Megan Carbines have, have asked some questions in there. Um, we'll, we'll make sure we follow up in some capacity to those. But we'd just like to throw out a general one um, to the whole panel. We, I briefly mentioned synthesis of the synthesis happening in that final year, okay? So go ahead, imagine you're to 2024, what are we actually producing? What are we actually doing? What does that look like? Does that, anyone have any ideas around what, what it might look like? What sort of output we come out with? What's that dream thing that we actually land on in that final year? Any, any last thoughts before we sign off? If you could just um, teach us how to enable EBM, be sweet. <laughs> That's simple. One pager. Okay, that's a tough one to answer. <laughs> it's an iterative process. It, know that. And it goes back to that it's going to look different in different formats and it needs to be in multiple different formats. From central government, it's almost like a how to beginner's guide for dummies. Step one do this, step two, do this. When you've got uncertainty, apply this tool. When you've got that, apply that tool. Think about these key things. And we know it, but it's just sometimes that's really super simplified. You're telling your 12 year old how to do EBM as opposed to not everybody that is implementing the outcomes of the, of the challenge projects fully grasps the concepts or fully grasps the technical nature of it. So it really is super simplifying it. Thank you. I might just quickly jump in. I guess in, um, in terms of Chair Māori synthesis, you know, it, it's really aiming towards empowering iwi hapu and communities to be able to um, reconnect in meaningful ways their relationship with the ocean and so in terms of you know the aspiration for 2024 I guess at least from my perspective is um, being able to provide what's necessary for um, communities to do exactly that um, and there will be as Kirsty mentioned there'll be there'll be things that they can do immediately if not have already started doing as part of their journey with the challenge um, and, but there will also be things that will take time and need further finessing and work and so I suppose it's creating a momentum 
one of the things we heard um, early in the challenge from a range of partners and stakeholders was we want the challenge to create momentum for change. So hopefully that's kind of, yeah, my aspiration at least for 2024, having created that momentum in meaningful ways. Chris, can I add to that as well? I was I was particularly taken by some of the things that, that Becky said about the way in which the challenge has um, influenced more long-term, uh, medium to long-term thinking in the in the Hawke's Bay. And I think too often we we underplay the value of the challenge in those in those terms. And I I'd echo completely echo Linda's comments and uh, extend them all to all um, dimensions of the challenges work and if we can feel if we can feel and have it affirmed by others that we've we have made contributions in those terms I, for me working through in 2024 the x months of 2024 working through how we distill that how we represent it how we can communicate that particular impact becomes something of a challenge that we haven't yet got our heads around. Um, but the, being confident that we have um, put in place some momentum I've, and also some of the processes, the more particular fine grained processes to deal with day to day uh, kinds of questions, I think would be really, really, um, would be a statement of achievement um, if we can manage that. Great, thank you, thank you, Nick. And those are great words to end on from all of you. And I just wanna thank you all for participating in today's webinar. It's been really insightful and I hope all those that um, engage as participants enjoy the time. Um, if, again, we'll pass on those remaining questions to the panel and encourage you to go to the website where we should have most of this information online and this will be has been recorded. And I'll now ask Anaru to close this out for the, for the webinar. Thank you, Anaru. あ、てなかと、あ、こと。あ、あ、意味やとき uh, ke